Think Forward. Think Research Channel. My uh, pleasure to welcome you all to our home. The biggest challenge in understanding the body is to understand how the brain functions, and that's the most complex. It's the last, most challenging frontier. it's become a reality to fund the whole series of seminars for the National Academy of Sciences. I'd say in the last 50 years, extraordinary things have happened and breakthroughs in brain research are now probably the hottest breakthroughs in all biomedical research. It's very clear that the next couple of decades on uh, neuroscience research will surely dominate all biomedical research. And that's the most complex. It's the last, most challenging frontier for biomedical research. And that's attracted the attention of all sorts of outstanding scientists. Some of the greatest molecular biologists who won Nobel Prizes for basic uh, biochemical or molecular biological research can see that the biggest challenges are in the brain and they're turning their attention there. My own research over the years has focused on neurotransmitters uh, and they convey information in between the 15 billion neurons in the brain. Every drug that influences mental function uh, does so by interacting with one or another neurotransmitter system or the receptors upon which they work. And our research in our lab over the last 25 years has focused on identifying those receptors and other aspects of neurotransmitter interaction and has enabled us to understand how a lot of the major drugs that affect mental function exert their actions and also provide tools so that the pharmaceutical industry can identify newer and safer drugs. Every form of mental illness, whether it's schizophrenia, manic depressive illness, uh, serious anxiety, even personality traits, have a major genetic component and that the tools are now available to actually identify the genes that contribute to them. We may not find a single gene for each disease, but it's very likely that the genetic basis of the major forms of mental illness will be solved in the next, say, decade. I really want my husband to be acknowledged as somebody in the scientific community because he really is um, very much acknowledged and renowned in the art world and um, his collections are magnificent and he, he, he had a fantastic knowledge of art, every aspect and all that kind of thing. But he, he was, his science, scientific work was so important and really nobody knew very much about it. And um, so I wanted something for him in the science world as well. His vocation really was science and uh, he wanted to be a doctor from the time he was four. And um, so that was his, really his job and um, he, he was a researcher, he had his own laboratory, and uh, he was a medical publisher. He started the first medical newspaper for doctors. And um, Michael DeBakey told me after Arthur died that it was such an innovative idea that nobody thought it would succeed. So he was um, communicating with doctors all over the world. Molecular biology was Arthur's field. Um, he, he uh, his research was in to schizophrenia, and uh, he was well ahead of his time, although he didn't um, manage to find a cure, but uh, he realized the endocrine basis. And um, so 
we thought that um, a lecture on his subject would be fitting for the first one. My husband's basic motivation, I think, was to improve the world's health. Um, and this will disseminate the latest knowledge. Um, and he was uh, in the forefront of communications, medical communications. And um, so I feel that this is absolutely continuing what he was what he was all about and what he was trying to do with his life good evening uh, I I am Bruce Alberts the president of the National Academy of Sciences it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you all to our home uh, this is a very important occasion for us it's the start of the first Arthur Sackler uh, colloquia in the sciences. Uh, these uh, colloquia, which uh, this lecture inaugurates and uh, will continue the next few days here, th these colloquia were the dream of Arthur Sackler and Frank Press, my predecessor as president uh, of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, this dream, uh, long standing dream, was finally realized through the generous gift of Jill Sackler, who's here with us tonight, and I'd like to ask her to please stand. Jill. <laughs> the colloquia that begins with this lecture is uh, on neural signaling. Uh, and it's brought together eminent scientists uh, to discuss uh, re frontline research across a variety of disciplines. Disciplines. It was uh, organized uh, by Saul Snyder, who's the speaker tonight, and we need to thank him both for his lecture and for his work in organizing the colloquium. I'm very impressed by the fact that he just told me tonight that uh, he was very careful to invite the very best scientists he knew, and importantly, uh, he knows everybody. <laughs> but secondly, uh, Every one of them accepted, which is a remarkable tribute, to, uh, I think, to Saul and the, his reputation. Uh, this is a lecture is a, the an, the first of the annual Sackler uh, lectures, and these events that we're celebrating are organized by the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Scientific Programs. Uh, my role right now, when you, you know, when you have a very important speaker, you don't introduce them directly. You introduce somebody who introduces them. And so it's my privilege to introduce uh, Jack Halpern, who's chair of our Committee on Scientific Programs. Uh, he's been the pres vice president of the National Academy of Sciences since 1993. Uh, that's also as long as I've been president. And uh, he is presently the Louis Bloch Distinguished Professor of Chemistry Emeritus at the University of Chicago. Jack? Thank you, Bruce, and let me add my welcome uh, to you on behalf of the Committee of Scientific Programs, and also my thanks to Jill and to Saul and everyone who uh, collaborated to make this a great success. The prestige of a, uh, that attaches to a commemorative lecture series, such as the one that we're inaugurating today, rests on two measures. The legacy of the person uh, whom the lectures commemorate, and the distinction of the scholars who are selected to deliver the lectures, particularly the first lecture, which tends to set the tone and standard for the ensuing one. On both these counts, the Arthur M. Sackler lecture series that Gillian uh, Sackler so generously endowed uh, in memory of her late husband promises to be a very prestigious one. Uh, and one with which the Academy is very proud to be associated. Arthur Sackler was a man of extraordinary breadth, vision, creativity, and energy. His contributions extended over many fields, encompassing both the sciences and the 
arts and took many forms. This lecture series commemorates and recognizes particularly his accomplishments as a scientist and scholar, notably his contributions uh, to psychiatry and the neurosciences, among them the recognition of a metabolic basis for psychoses, the early use of ultrasound in medical diagnosis, and visionary ideas about the origin and treatment of schizophrenia that clearly were ahead of their time. It is hard to imagine a more appropriate scientist to deliver the first Sackler lecture than Dr. Solomon Snyder. Saul is the director of the Department of Neuroscience and the Distinguished Service Professor of Neuroscience, Pharmacology, and Psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins University. His pioneering research, notably on the identification of neurotransmitters and their receptors, has profoundly advanced the field of neuroscience through such contributions as the labeling of receptors by reversible ligand binding, illumination of the molecular basis of olfaction, and most recently, the identification of gases, notably nitric oxide and possibly carbon monoxide, as a new class of neurotransmitters. Additionally, the application of Dr. Snyder's techniques has enhanced the development of new agents in the pharmaceutical industry by enabling rapid screening of candidate drugs. Dr. Snyder's accomplishments have earned him widespread international acclaim and a long list of over 30 distinguished awards, of which I will cite only two. The Albert Lasker Award in Basic Biomedical Research in 1978 and the Wolf Prize in Medicine in 1983. It is highly fitting that Saul should have been selected to deliver the Academy's inaugural Arthur Sackler Lecture and the title of his lecture is Brain Messengers. Saul, it's a pleasure to welcome you to. Okay, thank you so much, Jack. It's a, a pleasure and a very, very great honor to speak to you. Um, one thing that's notable is that as you age, you have to have these things or else you can't see. Uh, now I can see you, I can, more importantly, I can see my notes. The, um, speaking of age, uh, I'm aging, and I recall that it is now actually uh, ex almost exactly 30 years ago that I first met Arthur Sackler, because I, I know specifically it was in May of 1970, because it was at a meeting of the Society for Biological Psychiatry and I was receiving some young investigator award and Arthur came up and he had actually been reading things that I had written, was very, very interested in it. And at this point in time, he was uh, in the business world and somewhat removed from active research. And I was just amazed that he uh, not only knew and remembered the things that I was working on, but had creative suggestions about them. I stayed a friend of Arthur's over the years. He and I were um, on the board of the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia, and each year for the board meetings, they're always held at the Art Museum of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, of which many of the important uh, items were donated by Arthur. In fact, he would take me around. I got my art history lessons from Arthur. And, uh, and of course, through Arthur, I met Jill, and she and I have actually spent time working together on the as trustees of the foundation for the NIH and other things, and, um, and of course, uh, uh, interacted in uh, discussions of the preparations for uh, her very, very generous endowment of the Sackler Colloquium. Uh, Arthur uh, was an extraordinary individual uh, uh, from a poor Jewish family growing up in New York, but he majored in art history in college and never forgot, never ceased to love art, uh, even though he then went to medical school and he and his two brothers uh, in the late 40s when psychiatry was being dominated totally by psychoanalysis, uh, the three Sackler brothers set up a laboratory in a state hospital in New York and uh, were doing important work aiming uh, toward biological roots of mental illness. 
but then he got into involved in business activities and art and so many things. And the uh, kinds of things I'd like to talk to you about tonight uh, are trying to describe a little research from our laboratory that reflects uh, the genius of Arthur in, in thinking out of the box and thinking a lot of different ways, different things. The next slide just summarizes some of his accomplishments and I'll tell you not what's on the slide, but just in general, he starting about thinking that, well, histamine uh, is involved in allergy and anaphylactoid reactions, and the corticosteroids are sort of antagonists of that, and thinking that similar systems might take place in the brain. Uh, in schizophrenia, there was a hyposensitivity to histamine, something funny about the immune system, and that sort of thinking uh, and a number of solid scientific findings were extraordinary. Uh, uh, to try and understand uh, how one makes creative discoveries and how one can be creative like Arthur and like some of the greatest scientists, including my teacher, Julius Axelrod, who's in the lab today and who's still active uh, at an age one year younger than my father. Um, what you've got to do is, first of all, it's very important to be able to do two things at once. As my granddaughter Abigail, who will turn four years old in two weeks, uh, she is already capable of doing more than one thing at a time. I, I have another daughter, granddaughter named Emily, who turned two years old uh, the week before last, and she illustrates the same, uh, another important concept is that you've got to think, you just got to jump off the wall sometimes. Uh, and here she is in her ballet tutu off the wall. When she was one year old, I even wrote a song about it. Uh, her leaps exceed Barishnikov. From 16 feet, her landing soft. Despite such heights, she'll never fall because all she can do is crawl. Um, you, I, I didn't inflict on you the melody. Uh, so what I'll be talking about is um, some novel chemical messengers, specifically um, Starting, let's go back first to the story of nitric oxide, uh, which is, was identified first as um, endothelial-derived endothelial relaxing factor. In uh, 1980, uh, Robert Fershgott uh, discovered that substances like acetylcholine that relax blood vessels um, don't do it in the conventional way one would expect, namely to act on the actual muscle of the blood vessel, which you can see depicted here is very thick muscle, and directly acting on receptors and relaxing it, but rather they had to act first on this single cell layer called the endothelial layer on the inside of the blood vessel, the lumen where the blood goes right next to it, and trigger the release of something that he called endothelial-derived relaxing factor Many labs worked for a number of years to figure out what it is, and finally, it was identified as nitric oxide. Um, uh, almost about the same time, nitric oxide was identified as uh, an important component in immune cells uh, and accounts for the ability of immune cells like macrophages to kill tumor cells and bacteria. So already, there were uh, many functions for nitric oxide perplexing gas. Then a number of us started wondering that perhaps it could do other things. Uh, maybe it might exist in the brain. And uh, I'm not going to be talking to you much about nitric oxide, but to make a long story short, nitric oxide is indeed a neurotransmitter, and a very peculiar one. You see, most neurotransmitters are stored in little round synaptic vesicles, uh, so there's usually vast reserve pools. So when the nerve fires, it might release 1% of the neurotransmitter. But you can't do that with a gas. A gas oh, can't be stored, it'll leak out. It's got to be synthesized every time there's a nerve impulse. And so one of the interesting discoveries of my then MD-PhD student David Brett was when he purified the enzyme that makes nitric oxide from the amino acid arginine, he found that uh, that uh, enzyme uh, won't act unless calmodulin, a calcium binding protein, is associated with it. 
and that all of a sudden explained everything. When the nerve fires, calcium rushes into the cell. Calcium will then bind to the calmodulin, active, activate the enzyme nitric oxide synthase, and will make nitric oxide. Now, um, and that, that concept is illustrated here. Now, um, neurotransmitters come in chemical classes. Um, but before I talk about that, I'll say just a word about the functions of nitric oxide. Um, because it's an interesting issue. It's very hard to figure out the function of anything in the brain. And for neurotransmitters that are the best studied molecules in the brain, it's still very, very difficult. Uh, even well-known neurotransmitters like acetylcholine and norepinephrine, we still know only a tiny bit of what they do in the brain. If you knock out the gene that makes something, then you can find out what's going on. We still don't know exactly what nitric oxide is doing, but we do know that when you knock out the gene for neuronal nitric oxide synthase, you do get what we call a phenotype. The animals are more aggressive than you would ever dream, and this is depicted very poorly here. Um, when Ted Dawson, the fellow in our lab doing the work, would come in in the morning uh, to cages where there were two mice uh, living with each other, one of them was usually dead. And it was usually the one who was a normal one. The one with the nitric oxide synthase knocked out was alive and just looking, licking his chops. Uh, extraordinary aggression and extraordinary hyperactive sexual activity. Normally, if you take a male mouse and put him together with a female mouse uh, who is in estrus, then she's receptive, and then you get babies. Uh, most of the time, she is not in estrus. She's not receptive, and he will make approaches, and then she will let him know to get lost, and he gets lost. In this case, um, these nitric oxide knockout mice just would not go away. They would keep on until this enormous squealing, beep, beep. And um, anyhow, so, for, so, so the little we know of the role is that nitric oxide has some kind of role of uh, down-regulating or modifying um, aggressive behavior uh, and interactive behavior that might involve sexual stuff. Now, neurotransmitters come in chemical classes. Uh, the biogenic amines, a whole slew of them, the amino acids, a lot of them, peptide neurotransmitters, a large number of them. So A.J. Verma, uh, one of my MD-PhD students, said, you know, could there be other gases that are neurotransmitters? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, you know, there is a candidate, uh, carbon monoxide. And I said, why? He said, well, it's made normally in the body. I said, you're kidding. He said, sure. He says, you know, when you have aging red blood cells, you must, um, the red blood cell falls apart, the hemoglobin comes out, and you've got to get rid of the heme because it's very toxic. So there's an enzyme called heme oxygenase that degrades the heme. And when it does so, as we see here, uh, it breaks open the heme ring to give you biliverdin, which is very rapidly reduced to bilirubin. And bilirubin is the yellow pigment which accumulates in the skin in jaundice. Uh, in addition, though, they release a one carbon fragment as of nitric oxide. So you get nitric oxide, biliverdin, rapidly reduced to bilirubin, and of course you release iron. I'll talk to you today a little bit about carbon monoxide and a lot about bilirubin, and I won't talk to you about iron because we just don't have the time. Now, um, we said, well, if carbon monoxide were a neurotransmitter, then the enzyme that makes it ought to be localized uh, in specific populations of neurons in the brain, number one. Number two, um, uh, it should act and do something. And you'll notice from this slide that both nitric oxide and carbon monoxide uh, activate soluble guanyl cyclase, an enzyme that makes cyclic GMP, a major second messenger system. So we wondered where was uh, the enzyme hemoxygenase, the neuronal form, or hemoxygenase 2, in the brain? And the answer was, 
very discrete neuronal localizations and with almost precise co-localization with guanyl cyclase, suggesting a role in regulating cyclic GMP in the brain. Now, um, let's talk about other analogies. So here we have analogies suggesting an, that carbon monoxide, like nitric oxide, might be a neurotransmitter, and I'll tell you more about that shortly. Another analogy has to do with the blood vessel story. Uh, remember, I had shown you earlier that nitric oxide forming enzyme is in the endothelial layer of the blood vessels. Uh, and the next slide depicts uh, David Brett's very first immunohistochemical studies localizing nitric oxide synthase in this single cell endothelial layer, whereas the muscle layer doesn't have any of it. It's also in nerves in the outer or adventitial layer of the blood vessel. And what was very interesting is when Rhonda Zachary, an MD-PhD student in our lab, did similar studies for heme oxygenase 2, lo and behold, that one enzyme is in the inner, the endothelial layer, and also in the neuronal layer outside. Now, one of the lines of evidence that nitric oxide is endothelial-derived relaxing factor is that um, if you take a blood vessel and it's relaxed, then if you add an inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase, it'll contract. And that proves nitric oxide is endothelial-derived relaxing factor, along with other evidence. But that's an oversimplification. Sometimes it contracts a good bit, sometimes it contracts a little bit, and sometimes it doesn't contract at all. It depends on the blood vessel. So there's a nitric oxide independent endothelial-derived relaxation. And if we look at that nitric oxide independent relaxation, uh, it's blocked by an inhibitor of heme oxygenase, an inhibitor of the enzyme that makes carbon monoxide. So we have another analogy between nitric oxide and carbon monoxide. They both are physiologic regulators of blood vessel diameter. Now, um, in terms of neurotransmission, to prove that something's a neurotransmitter, one doesn't usually use the brain, because the brain is too crowded, it's a mess. Ideally, if something may be a neurotransmitter in the periphery of the body, that's the place to look for it. In the periphery, uh, the intestine is an elegant place to look for things, because the myenteric plexus of nerves in the intestine is readily studied. You can electrically stimulate or stimulate with drugs, and if you set things up properly, you can monitor the relaxation phase associated with peristalsis, which we call non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic relaxation. And there already was evidence that nitric oxide is a neurotransmitter of that. To examine that question uh, further, we, uh, Rhonda Zachary stained the myenteric plexus ganglia for nitric oxide synthase or for hemoxygenase 2. Stains for both, and they're in the same neurons. So the same neurons are going to make nitric oxide and carbon monoxide. We already see the nitric oxide synthase knockouts. Uh, now we also have heme oxygenase knockouts, courtesy of a collaboration with Susuma Tonegawa. And uh, what we find is that, just look at this little one. If you uh, knock out nitric oxide synthase, you lose 50% of the uh, non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic relaxation. Knock out heme oxygenase 2, you also lose 50%. What's not depicted here is we now have double knockouts and you lose it all. So carbon monoxide and nitric oxide are both neurotransmitters in here in a nice elegant system which one can study them. Uh, and it's functional. This is not just game playing with strips of intestine. Uh, this actually has to do with intestinal activity. So when Rhonda Zachary monitored, uh, she took radio opaque little pellets and measured the transit time. And you can actually see uh, at this point at two hours, there's nothing left in the gut. It's all moved out into the poop. But if you knock out heme oxygenase, and you knock out nitric oxide synthase, it's still in the gut and not here. Definitely physiologically relevant. Now, uh, what's quite interesting is now let's take to the next level of uh, challenge. 
Uh, remember, if a gas is to be a neurotransmitter, uh, somehow you've got to make a molecule every time you need it. You've got to activate that enzyme. That enzyme's got to be very rapidly activated. And we already we had figured this out for nitric oxide synthase. To figure it out for heme oxygenase 2, or HO2, was a more complex challenge. And, uh, and the first thing that we did was we noticed the work of Sylvain Doré in our lab. He took advantage of the fact that he had discovered that protein kinase C will phosphorylate HO2, heme oxygenase 2. Now, to study this in intact cells, you can use a class of drugs called four-ball esters, of which one is known as four-ball meristyl acetate, or PMA. And that activates protein kinase C. It's actually a really useful tool because if you use like 0.1 micromolar, it'll activate protein kinase C. You go to one micromolar, it down-regulates it. It turns it off. So if you want to know if anything is regulated by protein kinase C, you use the two concentrations of this agent. This should activate. This should turn it off. Lo and behold, uh, the low concentration activates enzyme activity. The high concentration fails to activate it. So that was a clue. Now I'm going to switch gears. So this tells us it's likely that, um, that this is a regulator of hemoxygenase activity. Now I'm going to turn to another concept, uh, not so much carbon monoxide as a neurotransmitter, but the hemoxygenase system acting through bilirubin as a neuroprotectant. And this comes from work of Sylvain Doré in our laboratory, in which he was very interested in neuroprotection. Uh, which is relevant to stroke neurodegenerative diseases and can be studied in test tube systems in cultures by uh, treating with any kind of stress, like hydrogen peroxide, and counting how many neurons die. Now, when he did this, uh, first of all, oh, uh, parenthetically, uh, bilirubin does indeed accumulate when you activate hemoxygenase by activating protein kinase C with the four ball ester. And you'll notice here, the 0.1 micromolar that activates protein kinase C gives you a lot of bilirubin staining in those neurons in culture. The one micromolar, which doesn't activate the enzyme, doesn't give you an increase in staining. And this increased staining is blocked by an inhibitor of hemoxygenase. Now, when uh, Sylvain treated with 75 micromolar, remember that, a very high concentration of hydrogen peroxide, Horrible ester would protect, almost complete protection, at the 0.1 micromolar, but not at the 1 micromolar, indicating it was acting through protein kinase C. But of course, protein kinase C does a million things. Uh, uh, what evidence do we have that heme oxygenase is involved at all? The evidence is, is when we took cultures from our heme oxygenase knockout mice, Lo and behold, we lost the protection. Here's our protection, and here, no more protection in the knockout mice. Uh, black is for the knockout mice. Now, um, here we know that heme oxygenase clearly is involved in the neuroprotection. The heme oxygenase makes iron, it makes carbon monoxide, and it makes bilirubin, which is more important. The answer is bilirubin. And here it's very interesting because we put in bilirubin and we get fantastic neuroprotection. And what's very interesting is that we get neuroprotection when we put in 10 nanomolar. That's 10 to the minus 9 molar. And that is protecting against hydrogen peroxide at a concentration that's about 10,000 times higher. Now that's very interesting because hydrogen peroxide is an oxidant now, bilirubin was actually discovered by Bruce Ames many years ago to be an antioxidant, and that's how it's presumably protecting. But an antioxidant should protect against an oxidant stoichiometrically, molecule for molecule. How could you expect it to protect against 10,000 times higher concentration of an oxidant? And that was uh, very, very puzzly until we started thinking. And here's an example of how um, uh, just having ideas. You can get the idea, just the idea itself solves everything. And the idea is as follows. Remember, heme oxygenase doesn't directly make bilirubin. It makes biliverdin, 
which is reduced by the enzyme bilirubin reductase to bilirubin. Now there's a vast excess of bilirubin reductase in all tissues, so that um, bilirubin hardly ever accumulates. It's always converted immediately to bilirubin. And then all of a sudden it dawned on David Barniano, a MD-PhD student in the lab, and myself, that you know, maybe um, the following thing could account for this seemingly catalytic activity of bilirubin in being a neuroprotectant. Maybe bilirubin, when it uh, acts as an antioxidant, it itself is converted back to bilirubin, this oxidized bilirubin. But then bilirubin reductase will reduce it right back to bilirubin again. And so you get a catalytic cycle. And if that is true, of course, then uh, bilirubin should stop being a neuroprotectant if we got rid of bilirubin reductase. And David Barniano uh, did that with a very simple ap approach that I won't describe how he did it, knocked down. He didn't actually, he only got rid of about 50% of the bilirubin reductase in the tissue, and lo and behold, he got rid of uh, about 50% of the neuroprotectant action. So we're pretty convinced that this is what's going on. And it's actually fascinating because the, that very low 10 nanomolar concentration of bilirubin is exactly the normal levels of bilirubin in neurons in the brain. So we think that normally this heme oxygenase 2 is, has at least two jobs. One, it makes carbon monoxide as a neurotransmitter. Two, it's giving rise to bilirubin, which is having a major effect uh, in just protecting neurons in the brain. And the issue is not just doing it um, in brain cultures, but actually in the intact organism. Uh, to study that directly, Sylvain Doré, in collaboration with Dick Traston, uh, took our hemoxygenase to knockout mice, and lo and behold, uh, they have much worse stroke damage when you tie off their middle cerebral artery than normal mice. Now you might say, if they have worse stroke damage, that's just because, uh, you know, you knocked out a gene. I mean, it's not good, they're not healthy. Actually, the heme oxygenase 2 knockout mice are uh, the picture of health. We, we have had difficulty in finding anything wrong with them. The only obvious thing wrong with them is, as I showed you already, they're a little constipated. Hemoxygenase 1 is the form of the enzyme that's inducible and is concerned with destroying heme from aging red blood cells, very, very highly concentrated in the spleen. Uh, when you knock out HO1, the animals are very sick. They are all dead by the time they're three to four months old, actually due to iron accumulation in their tissues, and that's another story that I won't tell you about tonight. But they are very, very sick animals, but you'll notice here their strokes are not worse at all. So the worsening of stroke in the HO2 knockouts is for real and tells us that normally this HO2 heme oxygenase, presumably through bilirubin, is playing a major role in uh, taking care of your brain. Now, uh, one final little story I'll tell you about uh, brings us to yet another disease model or disease situation, Alzheimer's disease. And this started, uh, again, not from our being interested in Alzheimer's disease at all, but simply being interested in uh, learning more about this hemoxygenase 2. Uh, the reason we wanted to learn more about it was that Nobody knew nothing about it. It turns out when we entered the field a few years ago, um, uh, the only people who cared about heme oxygenase at all were people who cared about aging red blood cells. And they had focused on uh, this HO1 enzyme, which is, deals with aging red blood cells. Uh, Dr. Mahin Mains at the University of Rochester, who's a pioneer in the biochemistry of the enzyme, when she was purifying HO1, she just noticed in the extract, this tiny little extra peak, uh, and then she isolated it, and that turned out to be HO2. And uh, she and the other people who worked in the field thought it was silly. It was as important as the appendix is to your bodily function. You know, it was just a vestigial thing because it wasn't where it's supposed to be. It wasn't in the spleen. It wasn't inducible. The enzyme in the spleen is induced when you have red blood cell destruction and have lots of heme or other stresses. And this HO2 enzyme didn't care about any of that. 
And uh, so nobody did anything on it until we started working on it. So we said, you know, let's start studying it just in general. Like, for instance, what proteins does it interact with? So we utilize the, uh, uh, what's called the yeast 2 hybrid technique to see if it bound to any other interesting proteins. This work was done by Masa Takahashi, a visiting scientist from Japan, and I won't describe the details of it, but suffice it to say, he found an interaction with uh, one protein, a very robust interaction, um, with amyloid precursor protein. What is amyloid precursor protein? Well, it's the precursor protein to the small amyloid beta peptides which accumulate in the amyloid plaques of Alzheimer's disease and is thought by many to be the fundamental cause of Alzheimer's disease. We do know that there are familial forms of Alzheimer's disease caused by single gene mutations in the Alzheimer precursor protein, which people call APP for short. And those single gene mutations, uh, some of them, uh, just give rise to uh, different amounts of uh, amyloid peptide, and actually people haven't yet altogether figured out why those mutant forms of APP uh, cause Alzheimer's disease, but they do. And they've been well characterized. Uh, one's called the Swedish form, one's called the London form, uh, their Danish form, what have you, a lot of different forms. Now what we found was interesting is that when uh, APP bound to HO2, hemoxygenase, it inhibited activity. But the normal APP, it inhibited it only a little bit. It was just, you know, just no, not a big deal, uh, just barely significant. But what was remarkable is when Massa looked at the mutant form, Swedish, Dutch, London, there was major inhibition. This is actually an underestimate of the inhibition because when we homogenize the brain tissue, it's big, big dilution of the, t of the material. Uh, in fact, to give you an idea of what happens in an intact tissue, not only in the intact tissue, but the intact Alzheimer's mouse. Uh, obviously, knowing these mutant forms, it's possible to create transgenic mice that actually have these forms of Alzheimer's disease. And the one that's most available, at least to us, is the Swedish form. In collaboration with Dr. Sam Sisodia then at Johns Hopkins, uh, we looked at those. And, uh, and we stained for bilirubin. Just look here. Uh, to actually see bilirubin staining decently, you should stimulate with the sporbol ester, which activates the enzyme, as I showed you before. You get this nice, lots of staining in a normal brain. And in the Swedish mice, no matter what you do, you see hardly any staining. So actually, the inhibition of enzyme activity is really, really marked. And, uh, and that inhibition is functional, because if we just take the brains of the TG stands for transgenic, that means these Swedish mice, and we look at neurotoxicity uh, with much smaller concentrations of hydrogen peroxide or hemin give you neurotoxicity. Whereas basically the Swedish mice brains, the Alzheimer's mice brains are much more susceptible to neurotoxicity than the control brains. And the reasoning that it's linked to this inhibition of hemoxygenase comes from this experiment in which we take uh, the cultures, and we treat them with an inhibitor of heme oxygenase. We treat with, them with an inhibitor of heme oxygenase, uh, you worsen the toxicity in the control brains, uh, presumably because you're losing the neuroprotectin effect of the bilirubin formed by the heme oxygenase. But you have no change at all in the neurotoxicity in the Swedish mice because their heme oxygenase is already inhibited. Uh, exactly how this uh, influence on hemoxygenase and bilirubin uh, actually uh, functions in Alzheimer's disease, uh, whether there's an interaction between the amyloid beta peptide that accumulates in the PAC plaques and that people think are pathogenic, and the hemoxygenase is something uh, that we're working on as we speak, because this work is very recent. In summary, I just wanted to give you a feel how uh, it's possible, like Arthur Sackler, to uh, think in many different ways at the same time, think off the wall, uh, 
and how you can come up with surprising and fascinating findings. I thank you. Thank you very much, Saul, for this extraordinarily interesting and enlightening lecture. I couldn't help thinking as I was listening to you that this is a lecture that Arthur Sackler surely would have appreciated enormously and probably at this point would have asked you a very challenging question <laughs> or made some uh, uh, highly original suggestion. Uh, sadly, he's not here to do that, but I'm sure there are, there are others in the audience who uh, We'll have questions for you, and I hope that you're willing to entertain them. Sure. Uh, yep, by all means, anybody who would like to ask a question. You don't have to be terrorized by the big room or the tuxedo. Just uh, my teacher always said I have to wear a tuxedo when I give a seminar. Yes? Um, I noticed in your endosynthase knockout mice, they had very unusual postures. That, was there any problem with their motor function? Uh, very good question. The uh, question was, was there any problem with the motor function in the anosynthase knockout mice? Uh, we actually, this was a study done in collaboration with Randy Nelson at Johns Hopkins, who is an expert behaviorist, and he looked very carefully at all aspects of motor function. Didn't see anything funny. Here, their, their posture was funny because they were all jumping off on top of each other, uh, trying to tilt. Very hard. Sir, yeah, mm -hmm. I can see you. I'm uh, wondering whether the carbon monoxide signaling uh, signal is uh, interfered with by people by Right, a question is um, whether carbon monoxide signaling would be inhibited by binding to uh, hemoglobin. Uh, actually, that's rel related to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, uh, nitric oxide, and carbon monoxide both bind tightly to heme. Uh, in fact, carbon monoxide kills you uh, as a you know, toxic gas because it binds to the heme and hemoglobin and you, you know, become hypoxic. Uh, nitric oxide uh, and carbon monoxide both activate this enzyme guanylate cyclase that makes cyclic GMP by binding to heme. That's actually active site of the enzyme and changing its conformation and activating it. Uh, because of this, people have used hemoglobin actually as a tool to study questions such as whether nitric oxide is released in between cells uh, because the hemoglobin can't enter a cell. So if hemoglobin stops something related to nitric oxide, the nitric oxide has to leave the cell. So hemoglobin will also bind carbon monoxide. Uh, and of course, it binds it tightly enough to kill you, but not nearly so tightly as it binds nitric oxide. People haven't used it as a tool. Uh, I was wondering, in the, in the hemoxidase 2 knockout, where the MKO fusion was worse, is that have to do the level, of, is that at the level of the parenchyma, or do you see changes in blood flow, say, by laser Doppler, given that you showed that there was some, uh, the guanylate cyclase activation? Right. The question was, uh, in the hemoxygenase knockout mice, when they have a worse stroke, uh, do they have a worse stroke perhaps because blood, blood flow has changed in the brain? And in all studies of stroke damage, that's a classical thing that has to be examined carefully, and I didn't have time to show you, but in our publication, we showed that yeah, the blood flow was measured and there was no effect on blood flow in the knockout animals, in a normal brain blood flow. Yeah. In thinking about this from the big picture, you've mentioned two gases now that seem to have a major function in neuronal uh, activity. Would you care to speculate on any other gases that may make up this large group of, potentially large group? Uh, of sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we, uh, speculating is a lot of fun. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, the uh, one gas that's important in plant life is ethylene, just, you know, carbon, carbon, ethylene. Uh, so, uh, actually, A.J. Verma, who had the insight to suggest carbon monoxide as a neurotransmitter in our lab. He looked really hard to see if mammalian tissues would make ethylene and didn't find it. Doesn't mean that they don't. Um, a group of Japanese investigators have published a couple of papers 
uh, papers suggesting that hydrogen sulfide uh, might be a neurotransmitter or a neural mediator molecule. It is formed. It can be formed by at least one enzyme, cystathionine beta synthase, depending on how you do the experiment. And there is some very, very preliminary evidence that that actually might uh, have such a function. And those are the only two that I've got any. Do you got any ideas? No, I just <laughs> thought it was, a, it was a question appropriate to this uh, colloquium. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, if I understood you correctly, um, the products of HOs are iron, yeah. carbon monoxide, and Billy Burden. Right. Is there any connection with the increased iron concentrations in substantia nigra of Parkinson's disease patients? Oh, yeah, very, right. Right. Iron does accumulate in the uh, Parkinson's disease. The question was, does you know, iron accumulation in Parkinson's disease brain have anything to do with hemoxygenase? Um, there is iron accumulation in, uh, well, first of all, Parkinson's disease is associated with uh, a degeneration of dopamine neurons uh, whose cell bodies are in this nucleus called the substantia nigra. In fact, that's just Latin for black substance. It's black because the neurotransmitter dopamine is in those cells, and dopamine when it oxidizes, and anyhow, you get uh, coloring uh, for multiple reasons. But, um, and you get iron accumulation. Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with hemoxygenase. So people have speculated a lot of reasons why you might get iron accumulation. Um, but the iron accumulation, uh, by the way, I actually alluded to iron accumulation in tissue when you knock out the enzyme hemoxygenase 1, the inducible enzyme, and that kills them. What's very interesting there is that uh, the liver and the kidney are overloaded with iron to lethal levels, but the blood level of iron is abnormally low. And so that suggested to us that uh, iron uh, egress from cells into the circulation must depend on hemoxygenase. Uh, and uh, Chris Ferris in our laboratory explored that and show that that is absolutely the case. Because if you, for instance, if you measure iron efflux, just take cells in culture, uh, label their iron stores with radioactive iron, and measure how much goes in and how much goes out, and you just take cells from these hemoxygenase knockout mice, and it doesn't go out anymore. Transfect in HO1, and it starts effluxing very much. And, um, that led us into an interest in how iron leaves the cell normally. Uh, we didn't think that enzyme hemoxygenase could pump iron out of the cell. And it turns out, while there's lots of literature on calcium pumps that pump calcium out of cells, nobody had ever described an iron pump to pump iron out of the cells. Largely, it turns out, for technologic reasons. It's very hard to assay this sort of thing. And uh, Chris Ferris and David Bargnano in our laboratory uh, figured out a way of doing this and identified, characterized, iron pump, which is very, the physiologic iron pump inducible by iron. And we think that probably somehow the hemoxygenase is coupled to the iron pump. And that makes sense, because think about it. The hemoxygenase is not just getting rid of heme from those aging red blood cells. It's got to destroy the heme and all of those heme enzymes, all the mitochondria have all of these. You've got a lot of heme enzymes in your mitochondria, succinate, dehydrogenase, all lots of them, and as they get old and tired, iron leaks out, and if you don't, uh, don't get rid of the iron, you'll be sorry. And, and of course, the iron is going to mostly leak out when you degrade the heme with hemoxygenase. So it makes sense. Hemoxygenase is generating the iron that could kill the cell, so it's hemoxygenase responsibility to get that stuff the hell out of the cell by being coupled to the iron pump. And we're right now trying to identify that coupling at a molecular level. And those are the slides I didn't show you because uh, I didn't want you to fall asleep late at night. But, um, but that's uh, the tripartite aspect of this enzyme hemoxygenase. It's doing three different things, making carbon monoxide, making bilirubin, uh, making iron, and then hustling the iron out of the cell. Interestingly, two of those functions clearly are cellular protective. Bilirubin is a physiologic antioxidant, and we've de demonstrated that it is normally protecting neurons in the brain. 
iron, getting it out of the cell, is protecting the cell from iron toxicity. In fact, in Chris Ferris's study, he showed that the death of cells due to uh, certain cells in culture due to serum deprivation is caused by the iron accumulation. Um, and, uh, and then that's, a, now we don't know exactly what the role of carbon monoxide is as a neurotransmitter in brain function, but it might suggest perhaps it has some <coughs> kind of calming, calming down, uh, protectant sort of action, so that's total speculation. So do all the physiological functions of nitric oxide have the same uh, mechanistic basis? Oh, good question. Do all, the, do all the functions of nitric oxide stem from the same molecular action? Uh, I showed you only one molecular action of nitric oxide, namely that it activates the formation of the cyclic GMP, a second messenger. Uh, uh, it's pretty clear that that can explain all the actions of nitric oxide. And there had been speculation for a number of years, uh, based especially on very, very elegant work by Jonathan Stamler at Duke, that nitric oxide, which is very reactive, can nitrosylate sulfurs in cysteine. So it's S nitrosylation of cysteines and modify proteins. If you add nitric oxide, it's very easy to demonstrate that. In fact, you don't have to do the experiment. Any chemist could tell you that nitric oxide is reactive, Sulfur of cysteine is reactive, and surely it will interact. Uh, so it's obvious that that will happen, and many people, since scientists like to do easy things, it's very easy to add a nitric oxide donor to a test tube and measure your favorite protein, because you know how to measure your favorite protein already, and sure enough, nitric oxide will influence it and will nitrosylate the cysteine. Um, the question is, does that ever happen in real life? The trouble of, of trying to prove that, Jonathan Stamler got some evidence for that, but technologically it's very hard to do. Uh, you've got to be able to just measure this nitrosylation of cysteines and proteins easily. Sami Jaffre in our laboratory, very talented guy, figured out a way of doing that uh, very easily. And, uh, and he identified of proteins that under normal conditions, without adding any nitric oxide donor, doing nothing, they are nitrosylated. What's especially fascinating is that uh, uh, looking in the brain, uh, when he looked in the brains of the nitric oxide, on neuronal nitric oxide synthase knockout mice, mice, those proteins are no longer nitrosylated. So that proves that nitrosylation answer to your question, Jack. That proves, by the way, this is, he's not my shill. I didn't pay him to make that question. <laughs> that proves that neuronal the derived nitric oxide normally signals to a whole slew of proteins, including the NMDA receptor, the sodium pump, uh, glyceraldehyde triphosphate dehydrogenase, which is much more interesting than just being a uh, housekeeping glycolytic enzyme, uh, and several others. And it's normally, those proteins are normally regulated, at least in the brain, by nitric oxide derived from neurons. So that's a very, very important additional signaling system.